Good morning, church. Good morning. Is this thing on everybody? It is so good to be in the land of the living. It really is. Uh, it's been a while since I've been up here. And I miss it. Because there are so many things that God gives me to express his love, his joy, his peace, and his understanding. And it just could not be contained all in one sermon. So I have to return. I am glad to see my brothers and sisters from the Daytona Beach Church. When we first came to this city, we went to the Daytona Beach Church. It's so good to see them. I'm glad to see Max and Terry today. They are our newlywed sister and brothers. And we're so happy that uh, they are here. I love the way they sing together. Um, it is something I've always admired, being able to sing. Because I just harmonize. I don't really sing. Uh, it's not my gift. I will begin by saying this. Everybody is welcomed. Everybody is welcomed in the house of God. But everybody is not family. I'll say that again. Everybody is welcomed. But everybody is not family. What separates us from being family is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit separates those that believe, truly believe, from those that do not. There are many times that we can come to church and we can sit next to people who will praise God with their lips but curse them in their hearts. And you say, how is that possible? How is it possible that we who claim we believe, who have the love of God in our hearts, could curse them to our neighbor? It can happen and it does happen. But the difference is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? What is it? I noticed that during the Sabbath school class today, it was said that it is almost an insult to call the indwelling of the Holy Spirit it. We say the word it because it involves different aspects. It does different things. It has different functions. So we say it. But it's a person. It is a being that is inside of you. So we don't call it being it. I agree with that. We don't say it. It's who. It's what. It's how. How does it affect us? So the question of what is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Well, it seems self-explanatory that the Bible says that who is the temple? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible. And if we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the body inside of us, for those who believe. If it is the body inside of us, then it is not I, but He who is in me, that speaketh out of the mouth. Lord, let me, I pause for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I just thank you for giving me this opportunity to express your words to these, your people. Allow me to give a word of comfort, a word of hope, a word of peace, a word of tranquility to these, our people. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to do something. Uh, I just said that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is a person inside of us. It is God revealed to our hearts and our souls. But the problem is, or one of the problems is, when we choose to ignore it, when we choose not to heed to the Word of God, when we choose to not change the way we think. In the book of Romans, in chapter number 12, the Bible says to, uh, I beseech you that you be a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is the perfect will of God for our lives. 
But when we yield not to what is inside of us, we get in trouble. We get in trouble because we need to understand that in order for me to fulfill the will of God for my life, I must be directed by the Holy Spirit. If I do it, if I did it my way, it won't work. Trust me, I've tried to do it my way. When I was very young, it was easy to do things my way, even though I was disciplined. See, discipline was simply a barrier, a stepping stone. If you can get around the discipline, you can do anything you want. So the only thought was the consequences. If I do what I want, I have consequences. If I can deal with the consequences, then I can do what I want. The discipline doesn't matter. It's the same concept with the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. We can yield not to the temptations of the devil, or we can yield to them. The biggest problem in the church today is we are yielding not to the Holy Spirit. We are not yielding to God's will for the life of the church. And the result is in stagnant. We stay stagnant. We come to church, we sit in the pew, we go home and do nothing. Some of us have personal ministries. Some of us are calling people on the phone. Some of us are visiting other members. Some of us are doing things that are good works. But together, what are we doing? Are we really about the Father's business? No one needs to answer that question because collectively the result is the same. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit does many things. It reveals all truth to our minds and our hearts. It enables us to know God's will for our lives. It enables us to be able to love each other. Most of the problem we have with loving each other is we're not doing it through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're doing it on the surface. And loving somebody on the surface is like this. As long as you don't offend me, you are my brother, I love you. As long as you don't take from me, steal from me, do something to me, you are my brother, I love you. But once you offend me, then the love is gone. That's surface. That's not the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We are family by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And if God is in each and every one of us, then who should I love? Each and every one of us. Amen. There should be no difference in my love to this person or that person. When we do this, we will hear God's voice. We will know His will. And then it becomes a choice of obedience. See, obedience is not a choice in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Obedience is a way of life. Obedience comes naturally when you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You cannot be disobedient to God in His will. But we have a, another person. I say a person because when it appears to us, it appears as a person. Satan comes to us and tempts us, even in the Word of God. And if we know not the word of God, you will yield to the temptation. And today, in the church, the temptation is to do nothing. To be a saint within your own rights. To say, my house is okay. I have nothing to do with my brother's house. When we do this, when you do nothing, you are actually going against the purpose of the church in the first place. This is one of the reasons why it appeals to me that we don't be stagnant. That we allow the Holy Spirit to come inside of us and actually work. The Bible says faith without works is what? Yeah. Is dead. Do I have dead faith? <clears throat> if I have faith but I'm not doing anything, I'm not praying for anybody. I'm not visiting anybody. I'm not teaching anybody. What good is my faith? 
it is no good. So we as a church, when we talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what is the overall purpose of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? What's the purpose of it? Teach. To teach? Comfort. To comfort? Guide. To guide? Yes. To minister? The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to glorify God in us. It glorifies God when we obey His Word. In the Old Testament, it was brought up in the Sabbath school class, what was the purpose of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? One of the purposes of it was it was a promise by God that there would be a separation between good and evil. That was a promise. The fulfillment of the promise was who? It was Jesus Christ. He said, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it. It fulfilled the very purpose of it. So the purpose of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ, and his purpose for being here is twofold. Number one, to do what? What was the one purpose Jesus Christ came here? To what? Save sinners. To save sinners, to forgive us of our sin. What was the other purpose? To show us how to what? How to live. How to live in a way that glorifies God. This is the vindication of the Lord for on this earth. He's vindicated when we obey His will. When we love each other and when we obey His will for our lives. That's the purpose of it. But how does it do it? How does the Holy Spirit enable us to be obedient to God and not disobedient? How does it do that? Well, I just said the purpose of the Holy Spirit was to glorify God. We gain access to the Father by the Holy Spirit. This is important. And I'll tell you why it's important. Does everybody remember, we mentioned in Sabbath school class today, uh, the tabernacle. This is the sanctuary. We in this church believe in teaching the, the sanctuary. If you remember the sanctuary, I don't have time to go with the whole thing. But what is the first thing we see in the sanctuary? What was the first thing that was in the sanctuary? Did anybody remember? What do you do when you come to God in the Old Testament, when they had the tent and they had a, a, a tabernacle, what was the first thing that happened? The sacrifice. It was the, the, the sacrifice. Right? They had the altar there. It was all to a sacrifice. What do we do today that signifies the sacrifice? What do we do? We repent. Because the sacrificial lamb represented who? It represented Jesus. And he died to forgive us of our sins. So when you are on your knees and you confess your sin, what does the Bible say God is faithful to do? He is justified and he forgives us of our sins and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. So the first thing in the tabernacle was the sacrifice. When you confessed, then you're fulfilling the first part of the, the sanctuary. What was the second thing in the sanctuary? The second thing was the basin, which had the water in it. What was the purpose of the water? Cleansing. It was for cleansing. It is important to understand that if the priest went into the tent and he was not clean, what happened to him? He died. Period. Now today, when you come to the throne of grace and you're not clean, what happens to your spirit? It's the same thing. It is no use to you. So we need to come to the altar with clean hands. Because the Bible says, just like he says in when, you, uh, when we uh, make the sacrifice, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of what? Of all unrighteousness. So we got to be clean. It's very important. When we come to church, we come to church clean. This is the altar. Now when you go into the holy place, what was the, one of the things in the holy place? Does anybody know? Candlesticks. Light. Okay, the candlestick. What was on the other side? Showbread. What did the bread represent? Word of God. Does anybody know? Word of God. Okay. It represented Jesus Christ. It represented the Word of God. 
What lesson do we learn from the bread? Who is our provider? No, wait a minute. Maybe it's my job that's providing. Maybe it is my account that is providing for me. When we forget who is our provider, you start messing up. So it's important to know who is our provider. Again, what was on the other side? The candle. The candlestick. Seven candlesticks. What did the candlestick represent? This light was who? It was Jesus Christ. So understand that this is the Holy Spirit. The working of the Holy Spirit. If we forget where our source comes from, you mess up. <coughs> some of us have some experience messing up. Because we forget who's the source. We have the Word of God, we have the Holy Spirit. If you take any one of those out, you're going to mess up. Because you cannot perform the will of God. Now the next thing in the altar was what? Incense. It was incense. And why do we burn incense? It's our prayers. The incense represents the prayers of the people. We're not praying in vain. We're praying to our Father. He can't wait to give us what we ask. If you come to the altar with clean hands, if you come to the altar with a clean spirit, the Bible says created me a, a clean heart and a right spirit in me, then why would the Father tell you no? When he said in his word, he will give you what, he, what we ask for. See, the problem is some of us are at the altar with unclean hands. Some of us do, didn't perform the ritual. And I only call it a ritual because when we do something in, co in, 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 in coerciveness, then it becomes a ritual. But there's a lot more than that. A lot more. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is the working of God's will in your life, inside of you. That's what it is. If we do this, then the Holy Spirit will reveal all things to our knowledge. All things that God have told us, even things he said years ago, he will bring back to your memory. The Bible says that when you, uh, when you are faced with adversity and you need the will of God in your life, that the Holy Spirit will bring it to you. Then we have faith. Faith is a powerful thing. But we need works. Our faith is not by works. But our faith should in include works. Because without works, how can you have faith? What good is it? How do we access the Holy Spirit? How do we access the will of God in our lives? This is important. When we come to the altar with clean hands, when we have confessed our sins, when we have prayed, a prayer of cleansing. This is one of the reasons why we fast. What's the purpose of fast? Fasting is spiritual cleansing. We should have a regular routine of fasting. If you don't, start one today. That's important because we have to be clean. You cannot be in the presence of God unclean. And some of us don't understand that, but that's the way it is. You have to be clean. And when it comes in, when you come into the altar and you are clean, then what's another thing it does? It reveals God's will for your life. Now let's talk about that for just a minute. I, I remember during Sabbath school class, Brother Ray made a comment about one of his spiritual gifts. The purpose of the Holy Spirit, or one of them, is to reveal what your spiritual gift is. We should all know what our spiritual gifts are. Perhaps you could take the same test Ray took and find out what yours is. You may be surprised what your spiritual gift is. It is God's will uh, revealed to your life. And remember, we are consecrated for work, for service. That's the purpose of the gift. We can't identify the church one person at a time. We have to do it collectively. And that means collectively we're the body. And we need all the parts. If the prayer team is not doing its job, what good is the evangelism team? It's no good. 
We need everybody. If you're a member of this church, you have a spiritual gift, we should be active. We should be doing something. If you are not utilizing your spiritual gift, that's one reason why you don't know what it is. We need to step out on faith. You should know what your spiritual gift is. And it's okay if you don't. That's one reason to be praying. That we be one. See, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit ascended onto the disciples, how many people were in the room? Did anybody know? Was it just the 12 disciples? What does the Bible say? Should we turn to it? How many people were in the room? 120 people. Did the Holy Spirit fall on just the 12? It fell on everybody who was in the room. In fact, the Bible says, how did it affect people who wasn't in the room? Does anybody know? It affected people who wasn't even there. They heard it. They didn't know what was going on, but they knew something was going on. So it affected people who weren't even in the room. Now we come back to today. Collectively, are we affecting people who are not here? Are we affecting the community? Are we affecting the city? Are we affecting our neighborhoods? The question is very simple. Do your neighbors know you're a Christian? Do your neighbors know we're Seventh-day Adventists? Do your neighbors know that you have a love of God in you? See, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit enables the character of God to come through you. That's the spirit that draws all men to you. It's the character of God reflected by an obedient heart. If we do that, then the entire world would know who we are. They will know who we represent. They will know who we love. It's so important. So when the Bible says, let your light shine, this is the light that should be shining. It's the character of God reflected through an obedient heart. But it's really easy to become disobedient when we take our eyes and our focus off of God. Amen. It is not about me individually, it is not about you individually, it is about He collectively. This is the power of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It enables us not just to do the will of God, but to do it with joy. See, serving God shouldn't be a burden, it's not a, a, a task or, uh, or something that. Oh gosh, it's time to do that again? It should be a joy. It should be unspeakable peace. One of the reasons and one of the ways that you know you're not operating in your spiritual gift is if it's a burden to you. If it's something that drains your energy, then how can it be a spiritual gift? Because inside, the Holy Spirit praises God constantly. You can't wait to serve. This is the spirit that's inside of all of us. We love everyone. Fulfilling a need is part of our nature. Judgment is cast down. See, your flesh judges each other. That's flesh. He said the wrong thing to me. She did the wrong thing to me. That's flesh. We're in our spirit. We know. And we understand that people need help at different levels. People need help in different areas. Everybody don't need help in the same area. And we thank God that that's the case. And so we help our brother and sister when they stumble. We don't expose them just to spread gossip in the church. We love them. And if we love them enough, then that which was wrong will become right. Because by His Spirit will we obey Him. Does that make sense? Amen. There's one more thing I want to talk about uh, in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is something that is hard to explain, 
And I have to be careful how I say this because the Bible says the Holy Spirit gives us direction. And when the Holy Spirit gives us direction, I said earlier, we must be obedient. We must be willing to be obedient. Our sacrifice is whatever the will of God is. We follow the Lamb wherever He may go. We don't start choosing, well, wait a minute, but you're supposed to be over here. Why are you over there? We go wherever He goes. We are our obedient hearts. It's subject to the will of God. This must be very, taken very serious by each of us. It must be taken seriously by each of us. To hear the small, still voice of God, your ears must be open. The Bible says, let him that have ears, let him hear what thus saith the Lord. Now, everybody has ears. And I'm sure some of us didn't clean them this morning. Spiritually clean. So that we can't hear God's voice. Some of us need to take the wax out. Because we're not hearing him. And here's how you know if you hear the voice of God. When your actions depict the word of God, then it's from God. If your actions contradict the word of God, then it didn't come from God. That's how you know. So we need to think. Bible says to change the way we think. That's in Romans. And when you change the way you think, our reaction, I said reaction to something, is based on the word. How does the word say we should respond to this? What does the word say we should do in this situation? Because if we react on emotion, you're going to mess up. Because when we react on emotion, what comes out of our mouth? Everything but the word. Everything but the word. In fact, there was another question, and I would love to answer this question. And that is that, what really is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? What is that? How can I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Do we know what that is? I'll give you an example. If I curse God from this pulpit, if I said to you all that I really don't believe this, I just want to get up here and talk. If I said that, would that be blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? No. no. I can be forgiven for that. But I'll give you another example. If I told my brother I loved him, but I, in my heart I despised him, I hated him, and I refused to reconcile with him, have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit? Yes. That's what it is. It's when we reject the prompting of the Holy Spirit to reconcile ourselves to our brother or our sister. You have just blasphemed the Holy Spirit.